Okay, so now we're going to cover Ike and Tina Turner, the combo. Hopefully, hopefully no one screams "Eat the cake, Tina." For those that have seen uh, uh, "What's Love Got to Do with It" before, have, have you guys ever seen, seen that movie? That, actually, oh no. wow, it's... I haven't either. No, what he makes her eat cake? What's cake's delicious? A, What's so wrong with there's that? There's a there's a very very infamous scene in that in which uh, Lawrence Fishburne plays Ike Turner mm-hmm. and uh, Angela Bassett plays uh, Tina Turner, and you know Ike is obviously you know abusive, abusive as yeah. I think is well documented. And there's a cake given to her, and Ike starts screaming, "Eat the cake, Tina! Eat the cake, Tina!" <laughs> and true story, when I was okay. in college, when I was in college, we had a cat that a friend of ours had, but the cat could not be taken into her apartment, um, and the cat had had been abused, and it was in an animal shelter, and the cat did not have a name, which was kind of sad. And my roommate Roland <laughs> decided to name the cat Tina because the movie was <laughs> out at the time. And there you go. So, true story. Amazing. Yeah, there's a couple other great stories about that cat, too, who was very well treated. Um, but, yeah, that's the one that comes is that, nice. is that cake story true, or is that made for the Yeah, death, oh, yeah, it's definitely. Movie? No, it, it, okay. from everything I've heard, it was definitely. Uh, Ike always said it was elaborate it but pretty much everybody else yeah. <laughs> said it was now true, i'm gonna so. feel bad every time i eat cake like i'm gonna it's like it that's a little bit of something. an overreaction <laughs> yeah <you can> still <laughs> eat really cake and not, not associate it with that so I have but, a, i'm very sensitive john you're over empathetic <laughs> but anyway in in the spirit of of uh art and it being challenging and difficult at times with complicated people i do think that uh we should talk about this album which is actually proud mary the best of so it is actually a compilation album it's going to be the first compilation album we've done we've done some live albums and we've done some double albums but we have not done a compilation album yet even on the bonus episodes the so, elvis the elvis episode what do you guys did that nope. wasn't compilation it's a okay. live album yep. okay live album. okay mm-hmm so yes, yeah, so this will be our first cup. There will be a couple others that we get uh, in this uh, in these episodes, but this will be the first one we're going to be covering. Uh, so I'm excited about it. Um, are you guys ready? I'm going to set the clock. Uh, as you've heard before, how cold list and hot take works. Probably if you're listening now, you've heard plenty of our segments. Are you guys ready? Mm-hmm. Ready. All right. I have set the clock and we are ready to go now. So Matt, first impressions of this compilation. So I have to start off by saying I I do take some issue with having a compilation on a best albums list. Um, I was, it's slightly different with live albums, but it's, it's also somewhat similar. I think I more of an issue with compilations than live albums because it's like, I get why it's on here and I get why because I, I loved this. It, it was just there, there's 23 songs on it. It's an hour yeah. <laughs> and 12. What is it? An hour and 12 minutes, something like that. Mm-hmm. It's a long album and it's fantastic. There's no weak song on here. It was a joy to listen to. Um, but I but my initial thing is like, man, a compilation. I'll I'll make you a mix CD. That'll be like the best album ever. You know what I mean? Right. Like, you know, so anyway, I it's like cheating in a way. It is, a little bit, yeah. yes, exactly. Um, but having said all that, I don't, I didn't really know a whole lot of this stuff. Uh, my my main, you know, knowledge base of Tina Turner um, was from you know like Private Dancer and What's Love Got to Do with It from the eighties. The big the big <laughs> wow. Tina Turner hair. I mean, that's what I grew and up watching. Beyond Thunderdome. Uh, no, what's that? Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Oh, I didn't see one? that. No, oh, I didn't. Oh, I got yeah. yeah. She's um, awesome in that. That's cool. I, no, I didn't know that. But I, I'm aware that Tina Turner was, it's not like I didn't know that she was a, you know, a, a star in the 60s. And, you know, I, even though I hadn't seen the movie, I was familiar with, you know, um, her relationship with Ike Turner and, and all that stuff. So, um, so this was a lot of this was new to me. And it, I thought it was fantastic. I, first of all, I got to talk about her voice, which um, I really liked. It's, it's, you know, she's got a really strong Mm -hmm. voice yet. It's raspy. Like you still like the raspy nature of the voice that I knew in the Mm eighties is certainly here Um, in this record. It's still, it's a little crisper. It's younger, obviously. Um, But uh, she, she does an excellent job of singing all of these songs. I like it does. The album does progress. So you can see, um, you know, in the earlier parts of it, you can say it's okay. This is an earlier '60s song, and then the yeah. latter part of the album, you're getting into like funk, and uh, almost like uh, you know, like almost like Shaft type, you know, wah wah, you know, guitar mm-hmm. kind of stuff going on. Um, 
The covers were great. There's like a series of covers that kind of hit you back to back to back. Um, you, they do they cover come together, and I'm usually not a huge fan of other artists covering the Beatles because I think it's hard to outdo the Beatles. And I'm not saying that she outdid the Beatles here, but I think that it's it stayed true to the song. She made it kind of hers. I think that the production on here is really good too because I really like the way that the guitars sound, um, the way that the other the background singers, the backing singers sounded, um, and uh, I found that very good throughout the you know the production uh, very strong throughout the entire album they go right into honky tonk women which was great they do proud mary which starts off slow and then picks up i really like that and then they also did you know there's a lot of cts highlights in here because then really? they did the yeah. uh i want to take you higher the sly and the family stone song so mm -hmm. i really liked i was like oh i know that from cts um so uh I yeah I I really <laughs> the enjoyed podcast it. I'm on uh, the <laughs> podcast I'm on thanks I know that from the podcast I'm on I'm, I do I I'm doing myself so many favors on this podcast yeah. so I have to appreciate myself on that props to me um, but uh, yes but uh, I wanted to I only listened to this once we, you know I know I, I got a little bit more time to prepare for this episode but uh, I. I, I will certainly go back to this. This was an this was an excellent album from top to bottom. It's long, but it's it's great. I um uh, I'll I'll let you guys talk and we can kind of I can extrapolate more later. Gotcha, Josh. Yeah, I agree. I I liked it, seeing the progression of her music from you know '60s doo wop girl group to the more powerful, confident, sexy solo artist that she became. Um, I think I take a little issue with the fact that Ike is labeled on this album because I think he's only on like one song that I recognize. And it just oh, seems... but he's playing those bass lines, man. Oh, which are, okay. which well, he, are and he, freaking and he pretty, key. And he wrote everything, didn't he, yeah. basically? Yeah, he like, wrote his, oh, okay. yeah. Well, the stuff that's original, yes. Right. Because yeah. they did a lot of cover. But yes, but the bass lines, it's in fairness, Oh, wait, Josh. actually, T Tina wrote several songs in the latter part of the album now that I yeah. have this up. But yeah, but he wrote a lot of the earlier stuff. He did write a bunch of stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that makes more sense then. I thought it was just him singing like on that one song that <laughs> was pretty funny. Um, I liked the uh, incorporation of funk and and more into like we got to see some, you know, with the best of we got to see her progression into the 70s, which, you know, we haven't tackled that music yet on the main feed. Right. And um, and like Matt said, too, I I like the covers of all of the songs and because they were so fresh in my mind, I, we got a chance to see somebody else do them. I think the main thing, and this is why she's on the rock and roll hall of fame ballot this year is she's just like a supremely good mm -hmm. female artist. And I think she paves the way for so many other, uh, women acts and, and she makes everything her own. You can tell that on the covers. You can tell that, that she doesn't need a, she doesn't need to be part of a girl group because she's she is like take charge and you can hear that in her music so yeah i really enjoyed this too i didn't know her, a lot of her um a lot of the music on this album i think i've only known her from movies and and probably stuff from the 80s or when she was you know when i was growing up gotcha well i yeah. I, I do know tina turner pretty well and i was looking forward to this album um Unlike a lot of compilation albums, including some in the bonus albums that we're going to do, sometimes compilation albums can be a lot because it's one artist just over. Mm -hmm. I'm not much of a greatest hits guy, to be quite honest. I feel I like to see I like to see artists in their time. But I will say, as both Josh and Matt said, I think this was an exception to that. And I think the reason is because it's almost like two albums. The first 12 mm. tracks almost read as a standard, like almost like tina and ike doing girl group stuff and clearly stuff designed for the mainstream but i think even more so like to, to white audiences they're covering mm -hmm. a lot of rock music they're doing a lot of like doo-wop and stuff like that and then the second half of this album that kicks off with funkier than a mosquito's tweeter which is an <laughs> yeah. awesome song by the way <laughs> on all fronts too. is probably yeah. my favorite song on this and just great the way it's sang it, it changes entirely into a funk album that's incredibly yes. sexually explicit yes and i'd like to point out there's a string of for those that want to know there's a string of six songs that are funkier than a mosquito's tweeter upu padu use me any way you want up in the hia river deep mountain high nutbush city limits and sweet <laughs> rhode island red yeah. i don't if you don't if you're not a euphemism person, I'll give you a hint. Every single one of those is a euphemism about sex and in particular 
anatomy, I would say. And then say. the next two songs are Sexy Ida. Right, which is basically, yeah, and then Baby Get It On, which are less about the carnal nature of it, you know, like, and more so about sexy, strong females. And Acid Queen goes that way, too. Either, you know, Mm -hmm. Tina being the sexy, strong female or, you know, encountering other, you know, females, you know, who challenge her. But yeah, that second half of the album pushes it over the top for me um, because it's just, Mm. it's an excellent funk. The bass lines are tremendous. Um, everything's got like big, big hooks in it. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just very enjoyable and nothing like we've covered outside of the Isaac Hayes album. Um, and, and as you guys said, it's, it's stuff from the seventies and it sounds like the seventies and it actually got me very excited for our seventies stuff. It was very like refreshing to hear something different. I would agree 100%, but yeah, I, I very much enjoyed this album. As they said, I, I don't know if I can rank it in the, the tippy top of it because it is a compilation album, and I do put a little bit of a handicap on that. But, yeah, I, I, all the pieces fit together for me. Tina Turner's voice, the songs, um, the, the bass lines, uh, the Ikeettes when they came in, I thought, really complimented mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, Tina Turner's voice as well. Uh, yeah, strong yeah, recommend. The, yeah, the backing vocals I really liked, you know, throughout the, you know, um, throughout the album. I thought that was all strong, and like I said, the production was great. Um, I liked yes. how sexy. I liked "Sexy Ida" part one and two. You know, it's the mm-hmm. same song but totally different. And I was, I liked the first one so much, and I was like, well, the second part can't be that. And the second one was like, no, this is. I don't know if I would say that I liked it better, but I definitely. It was almost like a totally different song. Um, you know, with the with just like they kind of did like one was much more of a funkier version and which one was more of like kind of like a rock version um but yeah it's for an album that's this long that has this many tracks i i really am struggling to find any duds i mean maybe the acid queen the last track might have been my least favorite on here you know um but yeah you uh, gotta watch the tommy movie though because that's that right that image of her was in my head from from here when i heard that song is that was that did that help it josh or was yes, that, that yeah definitely. okay okay yeah. um but uh yeah, and I—I I mean, I guess this spans their entire career, then, right? I mean, basically, this is pretty much this, yeah. is this the, the yeah. quintessential. Like, if you're going to listen to Ike and Tina Turner, this is what you would listen to. Well, I guess. It's, it's this is why they put it on the top 500 yeah. albums, right? This is the one that they said yeah. to listen to. And well, remember, in that era, T- Ike and Tina, it's you know, you have to remember them in the context of the 60s and 70s too, because it wasn't an album time. Yeah, for, right. Especially for black artists, you know what I mean. It was a, it was a very much a singles and designed to get you to watch live shows. And it's right. funny because look how many live albums we cover, and almost all of them that we cover on these bonus episodes and in the C- are, are artists that do R and B, soul, and mm-hmm. funk, right? Because it was designed to get you into the, into the the club, the, the music, the, even the jazz albums, right? Were really designed to be listened to live. Um, and so it is different. And so the album culture was not as big a thing um, in that genre. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and even though this isn't a live album, I was definitely thinking throughout this. Could you imagine seeing these people, th- these guys perform this? Like, yeah. re- regardless of the time, like this, you can just tell that a show that, that, that they're, they're playing music like this. And even the few, the videos that I've seen of, of their performances here and there throughout, you know, my life, really. Um, I it, it would just have to be insane to see them perform this uh this stuff um they, just great talent um you know great songs that that they wrote great great performance yeah and, the, and i have to say the production too really stood out because there were yep. times where i felt like you know maybe in the earlier parts of it you know the earlier 60s you know it's like okay it's a little bit more of a of a of a of a less a lesser quality um but i was definitely I was, you know throughout i was like man there, it's overall the and the guitar sounds too that's the other thing especially with like come together i was like okay how's this going to be and i really I really like the way that they did the guitar sounds in that song in particular. And I think that that extended also throughout the rest of the songs that it was just a very crisp, um, you know, uh, you know, clear sound, um, you know, for being in the sixties and the seventies, you know, I think that that certainly put it over for me, um, as being like a really enjoyable album. And in fairness, Josh, that is Ike too. So if we're oh. going to, you know, give him why the billing is there, that mm-hmm. is part of, part of his legacy actually, as well. I have to say to too, Josh, I was expecting him to sing more. I didn't realize right. that he didn't really sing. I think <laughs> right. he just did the up in here, yeah. like the, up, up, which is a great yeah. song. I think that was the only time you really heard his voice. But, um, but yeah, this apparently was released in 91. So um, yeah. it took him a while for this to, for this to, uh, for them to gather this stuff together. Well, well we're I, at the, I, uh, go ahead. I'm I sorry. I was just going to say, I remember uh, when I watched Gimme Shelter, 
uh, she opens for the Stones. And there's a clip of her performing Damn. at one point on the, um, yep. not not at Altamont, but in like another show in the run up to on that year. Um, in that so, Let It Bleed era, she was one of the yeah. acts that we mentioned. That yeah, remember when they did that crazy tour we talked about? Mm-hmm. Yep, she was one. Of the, she was one of the lead. It was like Chuck Berry, BB King, like Tina Turner. It was like a who's who of you know people that are going to bring the house down. And you got to give the Stones credit because to put those people in front of you and still perform. Yeah. I, I remember also we talked about the Stones had to follow James Brown one time too on that oh, one yeah. show. Follow and he came that stage and follow that yeah, follow that motherfucker. So yeah, that's like pretty <laughs> fantastic as well. So yeah. But uh all right, so we're at the two minute mark. Anything you guys want to add as we kind of come to the end of the, the cold take? Or the hot take I should say. We don't cover any she doesn't have any albums on the main on the main feed so through the decades. I just checked while we were talking. So yeah, what is the is, highest? What is the highest ranked Ike and Tina Turner album? I did not look that up. Oh, okay. I'll, um, but so this I guess is it, our only chance. I'm guess. I'm I would guess if we're talking a Tina Turner album, my guess would be Private Dancer from the no, 80s. I, would be. I was talking about, but no, but I'm talking about Ike and Tina Turner. Oh, if there's like mm-hmm. one that's like the you yeah. know. Um, I don't know. Maybe I can. I think they were but, just putting out singles compilations, Matt. You know what ha- I mean? I don't know if there's formal. I mean, no, they had they- to have album. I mean, I know it wasn't an albums here. I'll look it up right now. It is River Deep Mountain High, I, okay. Ike and Tina Turner, which ranked 520 in the 1960s. So, wow. so <laughs> uh, yeah, so we weren't even close to covering them in the 60s. But uh, I, I, it was great. I, you know, it's long, you know, but um, you're not going to. Uh, but it doesn't feel long. No, and, and, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, and that's one thing. It's that I would say there's an art to that as well. If you're going to do a compilation, because some compilations are inter- interminable, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 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 Best there's, ever an, al- there's enough variety on this album too. Oh, for sure. That you don't feel like, okay, it's like one, it's not one girl group song after another. Um, yeah. Yeah. Too. Best ever albums puts this in the nineties. Cause that's when it was released and it's 9,944 <laughs> in the nineties. So wow. <laughs> thank you, Rolling Stone. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, salvaging this from yeah (laughs) well anyway i think that'll put a bow on this segment i think pretty i don't want to speak for everybody but it sounds like uh recommend all the way around oh yeah yes i think i agree 